good evening. If you have a hymnal, we'll be turning over to hymn number 314, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Let's all stand, 314. <laughs> practice that. That's how you get everybody to, to volunteer, right? You draft them. And uh, so uh, good to see each of you tonight. Trust you're doing well. Good to see Shirley back there and, and good to see each of you all. Trust you're doing, doing well and glad to see the snow melted enough where we could get back in here tonight. And uh, so, you know, it's kind of what close as we get out here, right? And uh, a little bit of moisture last night. And, uh, but good to see each of you. Trust you are uh, doing well today. Do be in prayer for the events of this week. The memorial service will be Thursday at 5 o'clock for uh, Tracy, well, for Troy's memorial service, but for Tracy, Olivia, Emily, and then the rest of the family there. So don't forget about that uh, this Thursday at 5 o'clock at the church. Caroling, 5.30 Friday night. And then regular service is next Sunday morning, but Sunday night we'll have regular service time, we'll have, but we'll have a candlelight service next Sunday evening. Uh, so we'll have a great time there. So be in prayer for these folks. We've got a lot of folks traveling uh, this week. So uh, Lex and Jenny are both sick, so be in prayer for them. Glenn and I, Rayla, are leaving uh, middle of the week. Uh, Lex, and Je or Lex and Jenny, or I mentioned, are sick. Uh, Phil and Linda are leaving the middle of the week. Miss Cheryl's leaving the end of the week. Uh, who am I forgetting? Am I forgetting anyone else? People going off and traveling. So uh, be in prayer for all these folks. Miss Joanne opted not to. She opted to stay with us this year. And uh, so you be in prayer for her. Uh, she said we don't have to pray for a doctor's appointment tomorrow morning. She will not be at UCLA for that appointment. Uh, but we can pray for her healing. And uh, so you pray that she would continue to get better and, and feel better there. And do be in prayer for uh, Brother Bill Patrick. He is home. He, he, got, he was spent one night in the hospital Friday night. Uh, come home yesterday evening, but just not doing well today at all. And then Gene McCullough not doing well at either either. So let's be in prayer for uh, these requests. And ask for the blessing upon the evening. Okay, Lord, we come to you tonight. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here once again. Thank you for the privilege and the honor, Lord, to be in your house. 
on the Lord's Day. Thank you, Lord, for this morning and the cantata. Thank you, Lord, for those that participated, the choir, the, the pianist. Lord, thank you for uh, the lifting up our voices in, in praise and in song. Lord, I ask you now to help us realize the words that we sang are truth from the Bible. Help us, Lord, to uh, proclaim those same truth, not only this morning as we sang about uh, our Savior, Lord, but also as we live our daily life, proclaim it with our mouth as well as with our actions. Help us, Lord, to live our life to please you. Help us to be an example to those we come in contact with. I pray, Lord, that you would be with those families that are hurting. I pray for you would be with those families, Lord, that, that need healing. We ask you, Lord, to be with so many people this time of year as there uh, seems like things that uh, compound themselves this time of year, Lord. So I pray that you provide comfort and encouragement and strength for every family. For those traveling, provide traveling mercies. For those sick, provide healing. Lord, I ask you now to be with our services this evening. Thank you for this morning's service. And Lord, throughout this coming week, as we uh, approach Christmas Day, Lord, I ask you to help us continue to keep Christ in Christmas. We thank you for all that you do for us. Be with us and guide us now. We'll give you all the praise. In Christ's name, amen. Now be seated. Keep your hand on the sing once again. All right, now we're going to turn over to hymn number 317, Joy to the World, 317. See you there, right here, 5.30, as we pull out, all right? You can ride the wagon with us, or you can ride one of the other vehicles, so we'll have a great time. Come on forward, gentlemen, if you would. And uh, we've got to have a good time and enjoy each other's company, amen? Uh, I do encourage you to pray for our country, pray for our missionaries. Uh, as many of them, most of them, uh, will not be around their family at all uh, during any uh, most given holidays, so you'll be in prayer for them as they're serving across our country and around the globe. Pray for our military, the same thing. Uh, most of them will not be able to be with their family at, at uh, different holidays, including Christmas. So let's be in prayer for them as they're away, they would stay encouraged. And let's be in prayer for our nation, the leaders of our nation, leaders of our state, local leaders. Let's be in prayer for the division that seems to be uh, gripping our nation as far as people divided against one another. So let's be in prayer for that and ask the Lord's help in, in reuniting us. Amen. Also, if you would ask the Lord's blessing upon the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you for allowing us to be in your house tonight, Lord. Just pray for all the services and all the events that we have going on as a church. Just, just Lord, be in each and every one of them, Lord. Let us know that you're worthy of serving, Lord. We know that the, you just need you in our lives, Lord. We need your special blessings that you can bestow upon us, Lord. We just pray that you just be with this offering, Lord. Use it for your honor and your glory, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
going to turn over one page to hymn number 316. O come all ye faithful. 316. <laughs> Julian making it to Georgia safely and all of her belongings getting there and John and Sue made it to Florida so uh, they're there and they're going to be there I think uh, they don't even know they haven't got a return ticket yet but probably around I think five or six weeks or something they're visiting with their kids so they'll be back in around the middle of January into January something like that so be in prayer for them as they're there spending Christmas with uh, with their kids and grandkids and uh, so you be in prayer for them and we've had a lot of different things uh, that have taken place and, uh, over the last few weeks, and we ask you to pray for one another, pray for uh, our, the church, and pray for our community. Uh, there are several people uh, that I know that have planned on being here this morning that had some uh, things come up that couldn't, and, uh, and that we understand that, so it's been prayer for them. Some of them are having difficulty. And then we have several families that I know of personally that are struggling right now uh, financially and things and struggling a little bit with that for this time of year. So let's be in prayer for that and, and, the, and the needs there, and the Lord would work that out, okay? In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 tonight, if you have your Bible, we'll be looking at a passage here that, I know it's not the Christmas story, all righty? <clears throat> this morning out at the uh, RV park, I, I told him, I said, we're going to talk about the birth of John, uh, the pre-runner of Christ, because I wanted to reserve next Sunday for Brother Bill, because I'm sure he want to speak upon the birth of Christ. And, and so he's talked about uh, Zacharias a little bit this morning. Out there, of course, we enter Christ in the picture as well. Uh, but you be in prayer for Brother Bill Patrick. He loves that RV park out there. He loves that uh, going out there on Sunday mornings. And he's been having uh, uh, some health difficulties. So you be in prayer for him, though. That's just a, a, a highlight for his week to get to do that and be with those folks. They were hoping to come this morning. And they had some other things that come up, and they could not make it this morning out there from the RV park, I mean. So let's be in prayer for them, okay? Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This is a text that's often... Well, I don't know about often, but sometimes used, maybe preaching around missions and missions conferences and things. And we're going to look at uh, some of the same exact text, but we're going to look at a little different spin tonight, a little different application, I should say, uh, for our life in this time of year. Look at verse, chapter 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, ye, uh, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For their power I bear you record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, 
praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, uh, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. If you will, move down to uh, uh, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. And now therefore be perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so that there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. Uh, for I mean not that other men be eased and you be burdened, but by equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also uh, may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, he that hath gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. Uh, an interesting text here, and we won't go into great detail as far as the, the text itself, but the application here, I think, we can make for this time of year. And we have a lot of different things coming on and going on. And a lot of people hurt this time of year. And uh, a lot of times we put pressure as a society on people this time of year. Uh, we, we can often give uh, the stores and the advertisers, you know, uh, too much credit for pressuring people to buy. Buy this, buy that. Everybody wants this and our kids and grandkids and People we love, they see those things and they want those things. By the way, it's not just little kids' toys, big kids' toys too, right? The car manufacturers are going all out with their commercials this time of year, right? End of year clearances, you know, get the brand, get the leftover stock reduced, whatever amount of dollars, you know, and, uh, uh, but, and so they want to sell things. And we can give too much credit, I think, to them to put pressure, although we, they do put pressure, but I think we even put pressure on people this time of year. And by that I mean, uh, You've heard the expression, keeping up with the Joneses, you know, any, any Joneses in here tonight? All right, so, and uh, so, uh, so what happens is we, 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 we would say, well, I don't really care about keeping up with the Joneses, but yet sometimes we do things or feel that we need to do things that we really are not apt, ready, comfortable, <coughs> or afforded to do. But we do them because we feel pressure. Not that anybody cornered us up and said, are you buying kids? Are you buying your grandkids? Are you getting, what are you getting? No, no, no. It's just that we feel that pressure because guess what? Their friends tell them what they got and we want our kids to tell them that they got something, right? And uh, ladies, you want to walk in to your family or to the church or somewhere and someone sees a new ring or a new necklace or a new pair of rings and say, oh, did you get that for Christmas? Crystal, you're not getting it after Christmas, okay? And uh, so, uh, so don't ask her next Sunday, all right, or the following Sunday, all right? And then, uh, but uh, but the, the point being, we all feel that pressure a little bit. And, and the application that I'm going to make from this is, this is a context here, where Paul is writing the church at Corinth, but he's referencing the church at Macedonia. In verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, uh, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how, notice this, that in a great trial of affliction... The abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. In other words, they were in poverty. They were, in a, they were having uh, their, where they were at at that time. It was not an economic boom. <laughs> they were just surviving. They were getting through, getting by. But yet, they wasn't worried about their material needs. They wasn't worried about their, the pressure wasn't upon them to meet the material needs of themselves or their children or their grandchildren or their neighbors or try to be something and act like something that you're not. That's not the pressure. Notice this real quickly. Matter of fact, we don't even have a, any reference to determine that there was even a talk among themselves that they would do any of these things. They're doing this. They're giving to the, to the saints and they're providing the, for the needs of the saints. But really, the, the idea being here is a willingness to do so, not a pressure to do so. Let me say this real quickly. We will put ourselves in situations of pressure that are not needful to be there. We will cause ourselves to feel pressured when it's not that way. When there's no need, no one's really pressuring us, but we feel pressure because we feel somebody's expecting something of us. Now, let me give myself as an illustration, all righty? I know 
and it should be this way. There are certain things you should expect of your pastor. How many of you agree? Agree? Amen. I hope so. But let me say this. I don't feel pressured to be those things. I'm, please don't let this sound self-serving by any means. I'm just trying to make a point. Being what I am, I want to be for the glory of God first, not by the pressure of men. I want to be a good pastor because it pleases the Lord because he put that call up on my life, not because you expect certain things of me. I want to be a good husband, not only because she expects it, she should expect it. Young ladies that are looking... Miss Juline said they wanted, that she wanted to start a singles department. Was it Miss Juline told me that? One of, some of you ladies gathered up with her after church one night and said that we're going to start a singles class and we're going to be the largest class in the church, you know. And uh, Miss Juline said that. You know, I believe it was Miss Juline. Was it Miss Juline? Somebody remind me who it was that said that. And, uh, and but don't, don't, if you expect a young man, young lady to become something, if, he, if he's pressured into that, then he'll be pressured out of that. He should want to be that. Right? Now, you should have some expectations. But he should want to be that. Look for someone that wants to be, not is pressured to be. Look for someone that has a willingness to be. I want to be a good father, a good daddy to my kids but not because they're pressuring me to be, because that's what God gave me to do, and I want to do it to please the Lord, not because someone pressured me to. Now, let me understand what I'm saying. How many of you work, have worked for a company sometime in the past? How many of you have felt, if you worked in an environment of maybe piecework, you felt pressured to get a certain number of pieces? Anybody ever work in a piecework environment? Anybody? A few people? All right. You understand what I'm talking about, right? There's an expectation of you every shift to get a certain number of pieces. And you know what happens in that kind of environment? Trust me, I worked in one. Although there wasn't a piece count that they expected people to get, I was in maintenance most of the time. But, but there was, a, there was a, a certain number. All three shifts kind of ran. We ran three, three shifts, seven days a week, 24 hours a day company, all right? That's the way the company ran. And, and as a result of that, the company ran, and, and every shift had the same number of hours. That makes sense? Eight hours equals, times three equals 24. All right. So there was eight-hour shifts. A lot of times there were two 12-hour shifts, uh, different jobs, different things. But point being, and, and in doing so, those shifts had the same number of hours, run the same machine, and they, if they had ran that part number to pass, they knew about how many they sh should run in an eight-hour period. Let me tell you what happens. I work there. I can tell you exactly what happens. People can run more than that. Oh, yeah, they can do way more than that. Most of the time, there's a more capability than is performed. They only do what's expected of them, not what can be done. So if you're looking for someone to do something because you expect them to, then look for the bare minimum because that's all they're going to do. But if you find someone that wants to, that's eager beaver, you know, that wants to go in there and j jump in there and, and just the company I worked for, Rockwell International, they had a, a policy that they started about a year after I started there, and it was called, well, even now, maybe six months after I started there, called Continuous Improvement. I loved that policy. They had a big meeting, had us all into the meeting. They said, we're starting a new Continuous Improvement policy, and we understand that those of you that run the machines, those of you who work on the floor, you know more about what makes this company more efficient than those of us in the office do. So we want you to help us continuously improve this company. That, I thought that was the greatest thing they ever did. Because I'd already been in some discussions, you may call them arguments, but since you wasn't there, we'll call them discussions, all right? And uh, with some people that, that they wanted to show up and just do the bare minimum. And they would gripe and complain every single day and gripe and complain about this company. And listen, it was, I'm telling you, it was one of the best jobs in the town that we lived in. Well, more so, it was one of the greatest jobs, most sought after, highest paying, highest benefit jobs in our area. And I was privileged to get to work there. 
And I worked with people that every single day done the bare minimum and griped and complained and griped and complained and left the mess for the next shift. And, 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 and it would take two shifts to clean up their mess and the next person would come in the next day and they, would, and they would leave a mess for the next two shifts to clean up. And it was just a continuous cycle. And I'd pull some of those guys aside. I, I was just a punk kid, you know, but 19, 20 year old. And, and I'd pull some of them aside and I'd say, hey, what are you doing? And they'd say, I say, you're going to have to, you're going to have to work a little bit, you're going to have to work a little bit harder. You're going to have to, you're going to have to carry your load. You, it's not fair for the next year to do their work and yours. Wow, this, and they just gripe, and I don't care. And, and here's what I'd tell them. Listen, if you can find a better job, you're a fool for staying here. And if you can't find a better job, you're a fool for complaining about this one. Right? I mean, honestly. Do what you can do. And during that continuous improvement meeting, I, they, they asked anybody after they told all their stuff and had all the meeting. They opened the floor. Like, anybody have any comments about what you think? We were an all-salary, non-union plant, all right? In other words, we were salary plus overtime. So they, you got paid for 40 hours, but you also got paid for all your extra hours because there was plenty of those, all right? And, and so it was an all-salary, non-union, and, and it was a great place to work. It really was. I loved it. And uh, we had a great, a great setup there. And all you had to do was take care of it. The company said, we can do this and be profitable as long as everybody participates to their fullest degree. But when people don't, it costs. And they have to make changes. And how do you understand changes in company? Benefits go down. You know, what was once paid for, now you pay for. What once was a benefit, now is it, it, you have to purchase or whatever, uh, and things like that. And so, but I, they opened up, before people made comments, so I lifted my hand. And I know, maybe I was a little bit... I don't want to say arrogant, I didn't, I, don't, I didn't mean to be, but I was just, I was excited. And I said, well, I, can I just say that I believe anything that helps this company is our job? Because they was asking, what do you think your job is? When you're non-union, you understand what I mean? With union, non-union, union says this is your job. And there are people that would say, that's not my job. How many of you worked in union? You understand what I'm talking about? I've never worked in union, but I know a lot of people have. And, and a lot of them have, that's not my job. And if I do that job, I could lose my job. Right? Because union says, you can't do that. That's their job. But it needs to be done, and they're not doing it. Yeah, but you can't do it. I'm not a big union fan, can you tell? And uh, I'm not against them. I'm just saying I think some of them are mismanaged. All righty? And, and, uh, but I, I, said, I said, I think anything that helps the company is, is anyone's job. And I still feel that way, whether it be for a company or whether it be for a ministry. Anything that brings glory to God, anything that benefits this church going forward, reaching more, being a better witness, a stronger community uh, outreach program, a place for people to come. I think anything that we can do to help glorify God is everyone's job to do. I'm, I'm of the old adage, a, a need seen is an assignment given. Uh, just the way I live, you know. You see something needs to be done, you just do it, you know. Uh, you don't look for somebody to do it, you just do it, you know. Just the way I was raised. So we find this text here in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 where he's referencing the church of Macedonia. He says, listen, these people had poverty. They had great needs, but they realized the men of God had a need and they, out of a willing heart, notice this real quickly. I'll mark some things in my Bible in verse 3. For their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power. Notice this, they did more than most people thought they could do. Some people said, I don't see how they're doing what they're doing. I think I'd like to have met those people. Seriously, that's the kind of people I like to be around. Do more than anybody thinks you can do. Get it done, you know. I like that. And he says, he says, I'm bearing, he said, I'm giving a testimony. I, he said, for their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they are willing of themselves. Not the group had a meeting and they just said, okay, here's what we decided we will do. No, no, of themselves. See that selves, individual people, willingness, individual Willingness. The Bible says, Paul's writing here and he says, listen, I'm telling you, I've seen it, I've been there, I've experienced it, and I'm telling you, the church at Macedonia, those people have given of themselves first willingly. No one's driving them to do it. By the way, you understand this, please, under, please help me. You don't drive sheep. You lead sheep. You drive cattle. Correct? You lead sheep. There was a leading taking place by the church and by the people that toward no one had to say, hey, 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 hey. No, no, no. 
They said, you know, we heard that there's some men of God over here that, that they've been going without for some time, and they're doing a great work, but, but their financial need is really great. And you know what? We, we have a little bit we could contribute. And they, and they, and they went and, and they contributed, and someone else said, well, you know what? I, I could do the same thing. And of themselves, they of themselves. See that individual self, in, selves? Not, okay, let's, let's all have a meeting and decide what the church is going to give. No, no, no. They of themselves decided we're going to do this. Of themselves. You know this already. The greatest tool that anybody ever has to witness for Christ is the testimony of self. There's no greater tool. No Bible college will give you any, will equip you any better than the Holy Spirit equipped you when he knocked on your heart's door and led you in the way of salvation, and you can tell people how you were saved. There's no better tool that you have to witness with than your own testimony. Willingly giving of yourselves. You know what that means? When you give something, catch this, this is deep, that means you do without something. How many understand that, right? When you give something of yourself, that means self has to be without something. And I know this time of year, there's a lot of giving taking place, and I'm not opposed to that. Listen, if you want to do that, that's wonderful and great. Just be careful that you don't overstep Christ. Right? Let's keep Christ in the center of this and the gift that he gave at Calvary. But there's a lot of people, I meet them all the time, that are miserable in their life because they feel pressured because of expectation and not a willingness. They feel pressured. I told you the illustration of the factory. I work with people every day that if their shift on their machine, they, if they ran, uh, let me see, let's say they ran a 2,500-ton national press, and there was three shifts of that, and they were forging 1069 Side gears. Isn't it amazing? I can remember stuff from years ago. I can't remember things yesterday. And, uh, but, but I, and they were forging 1069 side gears to go in a Rockwell rear end. All right? Rock, uh, and, and, uh, a drivetrain for a, a semi. And they were forging these parts. And, about, and, on, and at 1069, in an eight-hour shift, if the press ran and, 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 they, and they just had a simple die change and a few little polishings and the press ran well, then, then they, would, they would run probably about an average of 800 a shift. So let me tell you what they did. They would run around 800 a shift. One should run 791, 803, 812, 780 every single day. I had the privilege of running the 2500 National Press for a while. I enjoyed the press. I liked running all the press. We had a bunch of them there. And that press was way more capable than 800 pieces a day. But you know why people didn't do it? Because the three shift workers had just, they talked about themselves and say, and they just kind of came to an unwritten, unverbal, unspoken agreement that we just want to do this. And that gave them ample, that gave them opportunities to shut the press down every now and then. And, and, and that, see, that was a big process. Shutting the press down wasn't like a, okay, hit the stop button and you walk away, come back in 10 minutes later and start it. No, you got to heat everything back up and all the presses and all the billets and, and, and all the dies. And it's a big process. But they could have about an hour of built-in downtime every day to go smoke a cigarette, to go to the bathroom, to talk, to listen to radio, walk around, whatever. And they could do more than that. But you know what they didn't? Because they were only doing what was expected of them. They didn't get in trouble for an 800 pieces, so we're going to run 800 pieces. On a, I, I remember specifically, I had some, when I, while I was on the press, I had a couple more guys on the other shifts, and we all got to having a little fun and enjoying each other. And we, have, we had a lot of fun. We had some, some dye that was running good and built good steel, and we was doing, and it was running phenomenal. So we went through about a week one time. We just said, let's see how many we can do. And we always, I love working with those guys, because see, if you didn't work with those guys, then you became the enemy, because you was doing something that you wanted to do, and they didn't, they only doing what was expected. So all of a sudden, they teamed up on you, and they would leave you in bad shape. They'd leave you with burnout dyes, and I mean, if you ever worked in you know what I'm talking about. They leave you in bad shape to, make it, to jeopardize your shift, to make it hard on you. Something's about to break. They, they nurse it along their shift so it breaks on your shift so you don't get the peace count. But I worked along with some guys one time. We had a lot of fun. We was running 14, 1,500 a shift of the same exact gears because we just took care of each other. And we was having fun. You know what? 
the day went just like that. I mean, it was like you felt good when you left there, the day you went through. And I know it was work and it was hard work, but you know, I'm telling you, it, however we work, whether it be for the world or for the Lord, if we do it out of pressure and not out of a willingness, then we will not perform the way God wants us to. We won't do it. As parents, if, we only, if we're just trying to keep up with the, with the other parents at school and we're just trying to, trying to do and, and, and provide for our kids everything that the, all the other kids have and we're not trying to be the parent, we're just trying to be the provider, then I'm telling you, we won't enjoy parenting. I talk to people all the time. They would never tell you they didn't like their kids. They wouldn't tell you they didn't love their kids. But they'll sure say, I just got to have a break. Now, my wife and I may joke about that, but we enjoy our kids' company. We enjoy that. My kids know that they come, by living in our house, come with, they come with an expectation. But the goal has never been for them to live as expected. The goal has been for them to, be, to live as expected until they can learn to live willingly. Bible colleges do that. You borrow their convictions when you show up there whether they were yours or not, when you got there. But when you get there, they have convictions that you have to live by if you're going to go and be a student. The idea of being there while you're there, <clears throat> you'll adopt some of those as your own convictions, and you will do them willingly, not expectantly. You, see what, you understand what I'm saying? Notice this real quickly, and I'm going to hurry. Everybody's already, I've, I've had a dozen of you come to me and say, Okay, I know you let us out early this morning, so you're going to re seek revenge tonight and keep us and whatever. No, maybe. All right, and, uh, but, but look with me. Verse 5, and, they, and this they did, not as we had hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. They didn't this, notice this, this is an interesting phrase, not as we had hoped. My wife before we've had conversations and I would say something to her and she could sense there was something going on and I, and and I and she'd say what's wrong and I said well we just you know something got resolved today and I'd share with her but before I, sometimes before I said I'd say she'd say well, how's that and I'd say well not as I not like I wanted it to it got resolved but not like I wanted it to. You know, sometimes you get a new car because of necessity. Not You wanted a new car or a different car, new to you car, but you didn't plan on buying it now. But you're broke. Aaron knew for over a year he's going, his transmission, his truck was giving him some problems. And Aaron really was hoping he would at least get through Christmas. But he didn't. December, right? About the first December, something like that, his transmission completely went out of his truck. You know what? What's he going to do? He put a transmission, he had a guy rebuild a transmission in his truck. Just the way it is. Sometimes we do things because this is what needs to be done. But the reality of it is, this Bible says this, they did this not as we had hoped. In other words, we had hoped that some things would get resolved, but they done way more than we had hoped. They didn't just give their finances. Notice this, they gave of themselves first. Themselves first. Can I encourage everybody in here tonight? I'm going to try to encourage you. Let me say that. I'm asking you, would you let me encourage you? <laughs> and I'm asking God, would you help me encourage? How's that? Can we try that this Christmas season? Giving of ourselves more than worrying about giving to but instead of giving from. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, seriously. It's really easy to give to. I mean, the world makes it easy. Sales, credit cards, zero interest for six months, right? There's all kinds of ways to give to. But what about giving from? Giving of ourselves. Of ourselves. Yesterday, I spent... Most of the day, almost the entirety of the day in people's homes and, and different people, visiting with people and things like that. And I love that. I didn't say that to try to get you to feel anything. I'm just making a statement. 
I did not feel pressure to do that. I wanted to do that. Seeing people, talking with people, trying to encourage people. Sometimes you, you, you get heavy and you get burdened and you get busy and it makes it more difficult. But the reality of it is, how many of you like spending time with people you love? I mean, really. So we ought to give of ourselves. Notice this, and I'm hurrying. We move down, for the sake of time, we move down. It says, he says, for I know the grace of our Lord, verse 9, Jesus Christ, I know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice. I like this. <laughs> Paul says, you want to know what I think? Let me give you some advice. I like that. I really do. By the way, in 1 Corinthians, uh, he even uses this. He says, I speak this not by commandment, but by permission. I like the fact that God gives us permission sometimes. Amen? I like that. And he says here, he says, uh, and herein I give my advice, verse 10, for this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. I like, I listen to this. He says, you know, some of you, he's talking to church at Corinth now. He referenced the church at Macedonia earlier. But now he's talking back to the church at Corinth. And he says, listen, uh, I, I, you want some advice from me, he says? You want me to give you some advice? This will be expedient. This will be profitable for you. This will be profitable for everyone. This would be a huge benefit to you. If you not only would do what you say you're going to do, but you'll go back and do what you said you were going to do a year ago. Oh, wow. I remember one time when I was there at Tabernacle in Tennessee. I won't give names because there's people in here that know some old people. Uh, but there was a young man came up to me at the end of the year, and we were talking about some things, and, and he came up and he was laughing. He said, but Daryl, he said, it's hard to catch up with God. And I said, I don't understand what you're saying. He said, well, for several weeks, you know, one week he said, I had spent money without tithing. And he said, I do it next week. He said, the next week, he said, that was more than I could give. And he said, and now for a number of weeks, I've allowed it to get behind and behind and behind. And he said, and here at the end of the year, he said, I've determined I want to finish the year and catch it up. He said, it took more than my paycheck to catch up what I've been lacking in being honest with the Lord in my time. And he was laughing. He wasn't mad or bitter. No one went to him and said, we've looked at the records of the church and you're tight. No, no. He willingly said, I'm going to make this right with God. I'm not only going to say what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do what I said I was going to do. Do you understand that? Sometimes when people will get a disability or they'll whatever, and and they've been battling in, with the Social Security office, whatever. And then all of a sudden, they finally said, we're going to grant you your Social Security benefits. And for the last three months, six months, whatever, they've been battling. So they said, and, and it becomes retroactive. And, and they write them a check. And it don't come that day, but hopes it comes right. And they usually they, they would write them a check that would be retroactive from the day that they first applied for it. Now, that's, they don't get that amount every month. But they get the amount from the months that the government should have been giving it to them. And they get this lump sum payment. Because, after all, you needed it back then, and we didn't give it to you, so here it is now. That's exactly what he's saying here. He says, he says I'm telling you, it won't just be profitable and beneficial to you if, if you'll just give of yourselves. <clears throat> it would be amazingly beneficial to you. He says, if you'll not only do what you say you're going to do from this day forward, but if you'll go backwards even a year ago and do what you said you were going to do then. <clears throat> there is two weeks left in this year. Four years ago, five years ago, something like that, there was a man in the church here said to me, he said, I've got behind in my Bible reading. And it was approaching the end of the year. So for hours a day for several weeks, hours a day. He tried to catch up on his Bible reading so he could finish by reading his Bible through in a year. That's just a personal conversation. He was talking to me, not 
comparison. He just said, I, I, he said, and he was laughing about it. You know why you can laugh about something? Because you're enjoying it. Does that make any sense? You laugh about it because you're enjoying it. He says, I'm catching up. And I say this because it's interesting here because you know what? I'll guarantee you there's some people in this room. Every one of us probably had something that we said last December rolling over the new year saying, this year I'm going to, and you finish your sentence. How's that? And I'll finish mine. I'm going to exercise more, eat right, read my Bible more, memorize verses, whatever. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to. Are we really honest with what we said we're going to do a year ago? I'm just asking. I'm not asking for a response. So aside from the health benefits and the cost, what about the ministry? A year ago, the Holy Spirit was working on your heart saying, you're going to be more faithful. You're going, to, you're going to pass out at least a track a day this year. That'd be 365 tracks. You say, that's not much a track a day. I would say if you poll the average church in America, well over 90% of the people in the churches of America don't pass out a track a day. 365 tracks a year. You say, I'm going to do that. You say, well, but it, I've not been at any, I don't always go out every day. I know. I'm not around people every day either. But I just try to make up for it every chance I can. <laughs> you know? I, 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 I don't keep account with what I do and what I pass out. It's not a, it's not a competition. It's not a, but honestly, I want to do that. It's something I want to do. No one makes me do it. Did you know that even before Brother Ralph stepped into glory, he never called me and said, Brother Darrell, did you go visiting this week? Brother Darrell, did you pass out tracks? Brother Darrell, did you talk to anybody this week? He didn't ask me those questions. Because what point is it to drive somebody? Someone said to me one time of another pastor that they were, they were there in the ministry, and they said, I would never want to work for that man because he is so driven. Now catch this for a minute. I said, I don't mind someone being driven. Just make sure that we're going somewhere. See what I mean? Let's not just be revving our motor and setting still and spinning our wheels. Let's go somewhere. You know? If we're going to pump the, pour the gas through it, then let's go somewhere. Let's do something. If we're going to stay up late, if we're going to get up early, if we're going to work, then let's get something done in doing it. Let's not just waste that. So with our life and this ministry, he says this, he says it's, it would be wonderful, it would be expedient, it would be profitable for you. He says, I'm telling you, it would be my advice for you. If you not only would do what you say you're going to do, but you would back up even a year ago and do what you said you were going to do then. Look here real quickly. Now therefore, verse 11, performing the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to wheel. Did you see that? So there may be a performance also out of that which you have. Remember what I said earlier? If you only do what's expected, you'll only do the minimum. But if you do what you want to do, if you want to do something, you'll perform more. He says, out of the readiness to will, there's a performance. The Bible does not dodge the word work <laughs> at all regarding the home or the family, regarding the ministry. Matter of fact, regarding the ministry, he says, He that desireth the office of a bishop desireth the good work. A lot of people want the office, the title, the cloak, the collar. They just don't want the work. No. The Bible is very clear about this. Work for the night is coming. Right? When no man will be able to work. God's only given us so much time, so many days. Look with me real quickly. Verse 12. For if there be first a willing mind, you have to decide to do it. I'm going to do this because it's right. Not because mom and daddy, not because preacher, not because Sunday school teacher, not because deacons, not because of church, not because of neighbors, not because no, I'm doing this because I want to. I'm going to decide to do this. And it don't have to be broadcast. It don't have to be published. 
It's a decision that's made in the mind. See this? Here's this. But if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. So, so yeah, but, but I, 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 Lord, I would really, I really, really, really would love to serve you with my life. Then what are you doing about it? I'm not acting silly. I'm making a point. I say, and I'm saying this publicly, that's dangerous, right? I've, me I've mentioned to Rebecca a few times over the past few months that this coming year, that I'll, I don't know that I will be completely soda-free, Coca-Cola-free, but I will be less Coca-Cola. <laughs> Matter of fact, I've about, just about decided I'm probably going to try to do like one a month. Twelve Cokes in a year. Can you think about that? I'm not exaggerating. I've drunk that many in a day. And I'm, gonna do, I'm thinking about doing 12 a year. One a month. I'm, on, I'm laying off. I say why? I, I really think there's probably some health benefits there if I laid off of it. Now, doctors didn't tell me that, but I'm pretty much convinced that there probably will be. Less calories, less sugar, less sodium, you know. But you know why I would do that? Because I decided to. Because guess what? You're not going to be with me every day. I could drink a Coke and you wouldn't even know about it. Right? But if I decide I'm not going to do it, then I put it into action. And if I don't put it into action, then what's the point? What's the point of saying, well, I think I'll do that, unless I mean I'm going to do it? Well, well, I think I'm, my wife will say stuff like this. We're going to bed early tonight. With all intentions, she'll say that. And sometimes it's accomplished. But you know what? Sometimes there's things that come up that prevent that, and you, it just don't happen. But the intent's there. The thoughts there and everything is trying to be happen to make it be there, you know. There's an action taking place because of the thought. The Romans says, uh, that for there is a first a willing mind, it is accepted according to the man hath, and not according to the hath not. Years before I ever surrendered to the Lord to preach, I used to sit in church and hear people preach. And I was just green and didn't understand things, still don't, but I'd sit there and I'd say, that would be the neatest thing. To see God speak through you. I hear these people preach. Some of my favorite preachers. I could give you their names now. And I hear them preach and I say, yeah, that would be an amazing thing. That, that, has to be, that has to be exciting to see God speak. And there was just a desire. There was just a a, 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 a long, there was just a, a want, there was just like, that is really neat. That's cool. How's that? You like that? Is that a better explanation? That's great. But I used to sit there and say, I can't. This is even before the Lord ever even was dealing with my heart about this, or at least as far as I know. But I just thought it would be neat to be able to do that because I was really shy. I thought it'd be really neat to do that. How, how, it'd be really neat to do that. But I, that's what it says. Let's just real quickly. The church of Macedonia, they didn't give because they had. And they didn't give because they had not. They wouldn't have to impress anybody. They did it because of a willing mind. Because we want to be involved and we're going to be involved. Let's just real quickly. It is accepted according to that a man hath and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men may ease and ye be burdened. He says, listen, the idea here, and I've told you all this at our church many times, the idea of our, what we do for missions or any other aspect of ministry here that pertains to finances is not to get you to go broke. I had a man in our church one time that I was in his home and he said this. He said, Pastor, I want to do more for missions. He said, I'm canceling my... I don't know what he had, cable, direct, dish, whatever. I'm canceling my TV service because I want to give more permissions. And he didn't have any other means other than if he cut something out. 
He didn't have any extra money. He only had X amount, and it was all delegated. So therefore, he had to breach one of the delegations. So I'm cutting out the television. He said, so sometime, would you help me put an antenna up so I can watch the news and some things? This person loved ball games and things like that, but he said, I'm doing this. I had another person come to me a few weeks later and say to me, said, hey, you need to talk to such and such. They had been over to this person's house and realized they didn't have this, and they said, you need to talk to this, such, this person. Such. They need their television. And you need to tell them that they need to, and you don't need to, and I said, wait one moment. I never told them to cancel it. And I will not step between them and the Holy Ghost. Absolutely not. Because they did it willingly, not forcefully, not expected to. And this is what he says here. These people didn't give because they were expected to. They didn't give because they had to. They gave because they had a willing mind. And notice this, for I mean not, he says, and, and what I'm giving you this example and this advice is for, is not that other people will have an abundance and you'll have a lack. It's not, I don't, it's not that I want them to be comfortable and you be poor. That's not it. That's not what I'm saying at all. He says, I'm not trying to get you to go broke. I'm not wanting you to live in a cardboard box. I'm not wanting you to, to do away with things. He says, he says, for I mean not that other men be easy and you be burdened, but, notice this, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want. Your abundance may be a supply for their want. That Notice this. Here's where the equality comes in. And their abundance will be a supply for your want. What do they have that I want? I mentioned this morning when you go Christmas caroling, one of the things that you find out, we've been doing this for years now, years and years. You'll leave saying, we're going to go Christmas caroling, we're going to try to encourage and some of the shut-ins and the older people are going to come to their house and we're going to sing and have a good time with them. But I'm telling you, you come back with way more blessing than you think that you ever gave them. I'm telling you. When you go to those homes and you knock on the door and you say, hey, we got a group out here. Do you mind if we sing a couple Christmas carols to you? Oh, that would be great. And you sing and they're standing there weeping. They can't get out of their house. They can't go anywhere. They can't drive, whatever. And they're weeping. Giving of a little bit of our time in an abundance that we had an abundance of, we got something from it they had an abundance of. Care, love, compassion. And we in turn got some of that to take with us to the next house. There's, there's a particular house that I... I've been to going to several years now, and, and it's a house that we haven't gone to the last couple of years, but it's a house that, that I called on the phone while we were caroling. I'd put it on speakerphone, I'd hold it up, in our, and while we were singing at one house, we would sing it at that house. And every year now that we've been doing that, the people were weeping on the other end of the phone. The first time we were there, one of the family members there because we went to that house and we were all singing there, one of the families of that house said to me, they said, I've never seen him cry in his life. But he wept because we showed up Christmas carol. No one had ever done that. We showed up at a house over here on Country Club one time where the man had been bedridden for a long time and I'd done some work for him so I got to know the family. And we showed up there and, and I told her, I said, we're out here to Christmas carol. We can't get everybody in the house. I said, no, no, that's fine. We're not wanting to come in. But can we just open the door and sing so it comes to the house? Absolutely. And they were encouraged. Encouraged by our singing? Are you kidding me? Again, giving out of what we have in abundance, we in turn get and receive what they have in abundance of. I'm finished with this. He says, but by inequality, now that this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, and their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. Notice in verse 15, as it is written, he that hath gathered much had nothing over. And he that had gathered little had no lack. Here's what it boils down to. With your life, my life, every life is different. Every life is different. People have said of me, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but people have said of me, people talk about you too, don't worry. I walked in this morning from Bent RV Park, so I came into the other building. As soon as I did, everybody in that room was laughing. 
pretty much they were talking about me, I'm pretty sure, when I, because they were all, because as soon as I kind of hear Ron say, or also somebody said, he knew, and they're all laughing. I have no idea what they're saying. I just done this. Here's the thing. The people say, don't require much sleep, a lot of energy, blah, 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 blah. They say things about you too. It doesn't matter. What it boils down to is this. At the end of this life, we're going to stand before God as a child of God. Now let me say this. If you're saved, this is what I'm talking to. I'm talking to the saved. If you're saved, you're going to stand before God as a child of God in judgment of what you did with what he gave you. Not in judgment of your sin. Your sin was judged at Calvary when you trusted Christ your Savior. You're going to stand in judgment of what you did with what he gave you. And he gives every one of you different. Every one of us differently. And if we'll give him it all, and we'll just give him our life, and that don't mean that our life, oh my goodness, please, I get sick of these people saying, well, the Christian life is such a miserable life. Really? I don't think so. I love my life. It's a wonderful life. By the way, that's on television too. And, uh, but uh, I love my life. It's not a miserable life. What else would I do that I want to do more what else would I give my life to? So well, I'm going to give my life to some factory earn some big money. And they'll cut you loose five years before your retirement because they got some young blood in there with, you know, loyalty is not there like it once was. So you're going to give your, I'm not, I know we need to work and get jobs on, but don't, don't give your life to that. Give the time that they need, the time they require for you to work there and do it diligently. The Bible talks about that. Be diligent. But give your life to Christ, not just your eternal life, but give him your energy, your life that he's given you, your, the 24 hours, the seven days, the 365, give him your life. And you know what? At the end of your life, you're going to stand before God, and those that have an abundance are not going to have nothing left over. There won't be any more piled up for them than those that had little because they gave it all. The widow gave what? The most. She didn't have the most. But she gave the most because she gave what she had, the Bible says. She gave what she had. So I, I'm saying tonight, don't this coming week or in weeks to come, don't just live your life pressured because if you're under pressure, you may break. Don't live your life pressured pressured live your life willingly out of a willing mind out of a willing heart lord i want to be the best you finish your sentence husband wife father mother child employer employee citizen christian lord help me be the best and not only starting today but lord I've got some ground to make up. I need to go back and say I'm sorry to a few people because a month ago or six months ago or a year ago I, I said I was going to do this. Lord, forgive me for that and I'm going to make amends. I'm going to make it right. I'm going to do the best I can to make it right. But Lord, I'm not just doing this because you expect me to. I'm doing this because I want to. And I, you know the old expression, if you do what you want, you never have to go to work, right? If you do what you love and do what you want for a living, you, don't have to, you never have to go to work because you love your life. So do that. Be that. Because they gave of themselves first. Lord, we come to you tonight. I thank you for this. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, our families are under attack. Our churches are under attack. Lord, Satan is trying to get us to redefine and reassign homes and marriages, getting us to try to rethink your plan for the home and authority. And Lord, if we're not careful, we will allow ourselves to feel pressured by the influences of this world. We will lay down the biblical authority and pick up some man-made authority. We'll lay down the biblical assignment of our roles in marriage and pick up some weak, anemic, 
man-made version of marriage. We'll lay down our roles as Christians that you've given us from John 1 where you tell us you've given us the power to become the sons of God. And yet, Lord, we'll lay down, down that power often. Instead of acting like one of your children, we act like one of the world. We act like we have no father. We act like we have no guidance. Like we act like we have no instruction. Lord, help us to have a willing mind, a willing heart, to serve you willingly, not pressured, not expected, but willingly. Lord, I thank you for what you do for us. Thank you, Lord, for your call upon our lives and your guidance to us. Be with us now. Help us through this week. Be with every family, every person represented here. We'll give you all the praise and glory in Christ's name. Amen.